are going to kind of continue that process. These are our first through fifth graders, and I'm so excited about this. Um, so I want you just to enjoy the season of Christmas as our children lead us today, okay? All right, let's go. Love it, love it. And the children will lead us. That's how it works, right? Don't miss the manger. What an incredible, I think I could just have an invitation and we could just go home today right now because that was the message that we all needed to hear. Just don't miss the manger. They did such a great job at the early service and at the second service. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. Thanks to all those who work with our our kids and our preschoolers, they do a great job. Thank you for being here today. Let me welcome you to Leoma Baptist Church this morning. Merry Christmas to all of you. Let's do this. Let's welcome here, everybody that's here, let's welcome all those who are listening online. Can we do that? Can we just kind of welcome everybody who's listening online? I know a lot of folks are listening online. I know uh, this week, I, I, I'm just reminded that a lot of our folks that are connected to our church that are working in hospitals and working in emergency rooms and on the front lines of this, this virus, a lot of them don't come to church because they're just, you know, they're trying to be as safe as possible. And I know a lot of them listen online. So thank you, all of you who are listening, thank you for all you do, um, for taking care of people that are struggling with this virus. Thank you for being here as well. Um, we're excited about celebrating Christmas. I encourage you to... Um, be back next Sunday. We're going to have Christmas at LBC. We're really excited about that. We're going to have lots of Christmas music, a Christmas message, and we're just really excited about all that's going on here. If you're a first-time guest with us today, I want to encourage you and thank you for being here. 
Uh, make sure that you fill out in the bulletin uh, the guest information form. Drop it in one of the offering bins on your way out. Um, and we'd love to know you. We've had a first-time guest here uh, at the first service, and we have a few here at the second service. So thank you for being here. I hope you've come ready to worship the Lord today. We've just had a great worship service this, this morning. We had a great time in small group. And so let's all stand. Let's all have a word of prayer together. And let's just worship the Lord together. God, we thank you so much. God, for the manger. We thank you, Lord, for that scene. We thank you, Lord, for what that means to us as Christians. God, we're thankful, Lord, that amidst all the things that Christmas brings in our culture, the, the trees, the lights, the shopping, the events, the TV shows, God, help us not to miss the fact that, God, you decided in your big plan that you would come down and become flesh and dwell among us. So you sent your son Jesus to be born in a little stable in Bethlehem. And his mother laid him in a manger. And this Christ child grew up to be the savior of the world. He died on the cross for our sins. He resurrected victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And God, today we worship you. In all of our heart and all of our souls, we worship you. So God, may you hear not just our voices today, but will you hear our hearts as we sing praise and worship to you. Lord, I pray this in your name. Amen. You know, God gives us life. He gives us hope. He gives us love. But he is literally the breath in your lungs today. Let's sing out to him. You give life. You are love. Bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour. We pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you on the you give life you are love you bring light to Breath in our lungs. 
Across the sky, these hallelujah be multiplied. Your love is like radiant diamond bursting inside us. We cannot contain. Surely come find us like blazing wildfire. Sing in your name, God of mercy. To your design, may this offering stretch across the skies and these hallelujah be multiplied. These hallelujah be multiplied. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant.
with our voices. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him, Christ the Lord. We give you all the glory. Give you all the glory. We give you all the glory. Christ the Lord. God, to you and you alone belong all of the glory. To you, Lord, we adore, we worship, we honor, we praise, we lift up. God, you are God and there's none like you. God, during this Christmas season, we're reminded of your goodness toward us. We're reminded that you loved us so much. You sent your only son, Jesus, to dwell here with us, to become flesh and be among us. And God, we worship you today. Because, Lord, we know that that story doesn't end with a baby in a manger. That story goes all the way to the cross. That story takes us to the death of our Savior, to the resurrection of our Savior, and to the fact that He has promised that He's going to return again for His church someday. So God, today we worship You, and we thank You, and we praise You. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen. Thank you so much for being here today. Hey, Merry Christmas! Are y'all, are y'all in the Christmas spirit yet? I mean, I am. I'm just glad that you're here. Merry Christmas. I want to welcome uh, all those folks. You know, I'm just, I've just been reminded this week, um, really since March, um, we've just had a, a tremendous following of people online, and we're grateful of the people that, you know, uh, for whatever reason can't get out and they listen to us online, so we want to welcome all of you folks today. We're glad that you joined us. I am extremely excited about this coming week um, for a couple of reasons. One, we're getting ready to have LBC Christmas here next Sunday, and we're excited about that, so I encourage you to be here for that. But we also have 200 community boxes that are ready to be filled, ready to be sent out in love to people in our community. So um, I'm really excited about that. I get, I'm, I'm excited about being able to show love to people who desperately need that. 
Um, I'm excited about kind of meeting here Wednesday. I know that those of y'all who are here, I encourage you to be here Wednesday. We're going to pack all those boxes. We're going to have a ham. We're going to have some canned vegetables. We're going to have uh, some cleaning supplies. We're going to have some PPE. We're going to have a Bible. We're going to have all kinds of goodies in those boxes. And I encourage you uh, to be here for us as we pack them Wednesday and the next Sunday as we, as we deliver them. And by the way, last week you were given some cards, and I've got some more of those. If you know somebody who would love to be a recipient of one of those boxes. If you know somebody maybe that you work with, somebody that maybe is lost without Jesus, somebody that's unchurched, somebody that's just in need, we would love for you to fill out a name and address so we can have one delivered to them on next Sunday. So I encourage you to be a part of that. So make sure you, you, you understand that and make sure in your own life you're, you're giving to people, you're, you're showing that Christmas spirit. This is what Christmas is all about. I want us to think about something together today. I want us to think about as it relates to the Christmas story. We'll get to the Christmas story, I promise. But as it relates to the Christmas story, I want us to think about something today. I know a great deal of Christianity has to do with God leading us to a point where we come to an end of ourselves. You ever been there? You ever done that? You ever kind of kind of volunteered for something and said, yeah, I'll do that. And then it really gets uncomfortable and it really gets kind of, you're kind of vulnerable and you're really kind of, you're kind of going, ooh, I don't know if I like this. I don't know if this is good or not. And, and you kind of get to that point where maybe you're frightened and you feel like you're coming to an end of yourself. I, I love the story. I, I love the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I don't know if any of y'all watched that or read the books or seen the movies. Most of y'all have. Um, it's a great story and, 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 um, I'm reminded of one of the lines in, in, the, first, in the first movie. Um, it's where Sam and Frodo, who are the two kind of main characters of the story, they are about to embark on this epic journey, right? They're going to go off and they're going to go away from their homeland. They're going to go on this journey to kind of destroy this ring. And, and they are going far, far away. There's going to be danger. There's going to be peril. There's going to be near-death experiences. It's going to be an epic Journey And Sam and Frodo are kind of walking along, and there's a point where Sam kind of just stops where he is. And he looks at Frodo, and he says this. He says, this is it. One more step, and it will be the farthest from home I've ever been. And I love that scene because it reminds me that this is exactly what it's like to walk with God. Is that you get to that point as you're journeying along with Jesus. There are moments in your journey where you just kind of take that one step and you say, that's it. Wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. If I take one more step, it'll be the most uncomfortable I've ever been serving the Lord. If I take this one step, I'm not really sure what awaits me on the other side. That's what walking with the Lord is really all about. Taking steps into the unknown. And folks, to follow Jesus to places where you're not sure how it's all going to work out is a little bit frightening for us. It's actually terrifying to many of us because why? Because we like to be in control. We like to know what's going on. We like to be in control. We like to stay in places that are comfortable. When I'm looking to go someplace, I look for the most comfortable hotel. I want the comfortable beds. I want air conditioning. I want nice TVs. We want to be comfortable. But I'll tell you this. Listen, church, this is the lesson today. Every good gift that God wants to give you is on the other side of surrender. Think about that. Every good gift that God wants to give you is on the other side of surrender. Everything significant that God wants to do in your life is going to require a measure of surrender on your part. Think about that for just a minute because this is it's going to take a step of obedience. It's going to take a step kind of into the unknown. And think about me here. I think about this. If it, it, this makes sense if you think about it. Doesn't it make sense that if growth is going to happen in our lives, that it would require us to take a step into the unknown, right? It would require that. I mean, it would require getting outside of our comfort zone. Isn't that the way growth works, right? Those of you who are parents who, who had that little cute angel baby that you gave birth to that's just cute and just, you know, just smiles at you and laughs and giggles, they grow up. It, it, it changes. They, they turn into five-year-olds and then they turn into eight-year-olds and then all of a sudden they're 13-year-olds and then they want a car. 
You know, that's how it works. And this is this change, and it's wonderful, and the change is, is all different, but it, it's, a, it's a struggle, and you have to surrender to it. So if you want growth, church, listen, if you want growth, if you want change, if you want salvation, if you want everything good that God has to offer you, doesn't it make sense that all of that's on the other side of you surrendering to him? Now think about that. We see this, we struggle with this in our culture, <laughs> right? I mean, we, we live in a culture where, yeah, we want change, but we want everything to stay the same, right? I mean, we see this in culture all the time. I, it's all over our culture. I just thought about all the different ways. One of them that came to my mind is like diets, Right? You know, diets are, you know, you hear these and you, could, you hear about these diets that just always boggles the mind because I see them on TV. Lose all the weight you want and don't change what you eat. And I'm like, really? I mean, I can eat pizza and ice cream and little Debbie's and I just, the weight will just shut off of me. It's like magic, right? Is that how that works? Most of you all know that's not how it works, but that's what we desperately want to believe. That somehow we want to believe that change Without change is possible. Folks, I'm here to tell you, newsflash, change without change is impossible. It's impossible. And so, listen, church, if you're going to follow God, if you're going to be a believer of Jesus Christ, you had better get comfortable with being uncomfortable. This is the walk of the Lord. God's, and, and this is the way you think about God. God's not going to leave you where you are. You've heard me many say, times say, you can't stay where you are and go with God. God loves you too much for that. God doesn't want to keep you where you are. He wants you to grow. He wants you to be free. So that means you have to take a step into the unknown. And that's what it means to follow God. Now, some of you are going, to Pastor, I thought this was like a good news series. You've got Christmas ornaments on the screen. This was going to be Christmas. We were all going to walk away with a smile today. This is kind of depressing. You're telling me we've got to change, and you're putting all this pressure on me. Look, I want you to understand this is great news. This is great news because, listen, all throughout Scripture, over and over and over and over again, with people like Joseph, with people like Jacob, with people like Esther and Moses, you see how they had to take a step into the unknown and God blessed them immensely. God just took over. One of the most prominent uh, examples to me is Abraham. The story of Abraham. I love this. God, God showed up in Abraham's life and he said, I'm going to bless you and I'm going I'm to bless the world through you and I'm going to do something great in you. And maybe, maybe that's where some of you are here today. Maybe for some of you here today, God has been stirring something in your heart. Maybe you're a teenager and God's been kind of stirring something. You, you don't quite know what to make of it. Maybe, maybe you're an adult. Maybe you're a senior adult and God's been kind of, kind of, you know, kind of pushing in and nudging and kind of, kind of challenging you and stirring something in your heart and you're not quite sure what it means. Maybe God wants to bless you, bless others through you. Maybe he wants to expand the kingdom through you. But you don't exactly know how, you don't know exactly when, and you don't know exactly to what extent. I mean, that's exactly where God has you. And Abraham, this is where God was with Abraham. And that's what God told Abraham. God said, look, I'm going to do something really big in your world. In fact, go out and look at the stars. See all the stars? That can't even describe how big it's going to be. And, of course, Abraham goes, well, how's that going to work? And, and, and God says, you're just going to have to leave. I want you to leave your comfort zone. I want you to leave your country. I want you to take a step into the unknown. In fact, this is not my scripture today, but I'll get to Luke chapter 1 in just a minute. But Hebrews chapter 11 verse 8 kind of gives us a glimpse of what Abraham did. It says this. It says, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. Now look at this. This is staggering. And he went out. Not knowing where he was going. He just said, yes, I'll go. I don't know where I'm going. I mean, God said, leave. Abraham said, where? God said, I'll show you. Just start walking. Just start going. And Abraham said, yes. That's what it is, folks. Listen, this is what it means to follow God. To just, to just take the next step. 
We don't always have the end game in mind. We don't always know what that's going to be. But we just have to take a step. And maybe some of you are going, Pastor, I, I don't know what my next step is. Well, then that's your prayer. That's your prayer. God, show me what the next step in my life is. But I dare say that many of you here today, God's already stirring something in your heart. He's, there's already something kind of boiling in there. Something's percolating in there. And you just want it to come out. And you don't know exactly what it means. You don't know exactly how to do it. You don't know exactly when or to what extent. And, and I'm just encouraging you to take that step. Because when you, you, when you come to the end of yourself, when you come to your limit, and when you, when you kind of take that next step into the unknown, folks, it is very terrifying. But that's what's required to follow the Lord. That's why, how it works. And folks, listen, this is, this is at the heart of the Christmas story. Believe it or not. The Christmas story, I love this, this whole concept of stepping into the unknown, this whole process of taking that next step is really what Christmas is all about. I mean, think about it. Just starting with Jesus. Just starting with Jesus. I mean, what does it mean? The whole idea of the incarnation, that's what we celebrate at Christmas, is that God became flesh and dwelt among us. It's the incarnation. This whole concept of God becoming flesh and dwelling among us. It's about God stepping out. Listen, it's about God stepping out of the comforts of the heavenlies and stepping into the ugliness of humanity. This is what Christmas is about. It's about God going, going from being eternal to now being temporal, from being infinite to being finite. This is what Christmas is all about. Now, so the whole idea of, of stepping out into the unknown, the whole idea of kind of this, just kind of taking that next step plays out all throughout the Christmas story. There's several ways I could take this, but this morning I want you to turn over to Luke chapter 1, verse 26. I want you to think about it as it relates to Jesus' mother, Mary. I mean, I just love this story. Luke records for us the story of Mary and her experience that first Christmas. In Luke chapter 1, we read it this way. Verse 26 says this. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now, I want you to kind of understand this. Most of you know the story. We all know the girl's name is Mary, right? Mother of Jesus. So this girl Mary, who, who folks, listen, she has her whole life in front of her. She's excited. She's engaged. She's registered at Walmart and Target. She's got photographers. She's picking out wedding dresses. You know, she's looking over Pinterest and sending all the ideas about how her wedding's going to take place. This is what she's doing. Her life is, is filled with all these possibilities. Oh, my goodness, my life with Joseph. We're going to do this. We're going to live here. All this stuff is happening until this angel shows up. And this angel kind of just puts all these plans on hold. And by the way, church, listen, this is often how God works. This is how often how God does. We have, we kind of have our own ideas about how our life should be. We have our own thoughts about how things should go. And all of a sudden, God shows up. And this is what the angel says to her. Look at verse 28. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. I don't know about you. If an angel comes to talk to me, I would like for him to start this way. This would be nice for me. Oh, favored one, greetings. You have favor with God. That would be great. I think all of us would be excited about this. Mary, you know, I would think Mary should be excited about this. I would think that maybe, you know, this is an incredible kind of moment in Mary's life. But I want you to see the contrast in the language of what Mary does in verse 29. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And folks, this is, by the way, this is how it works in our own lives, right? This is how it works. God shows up. He begins to stir some things up in our hearts and in our minds. And then what we do is we kind of back up and go, uh-oh, whoa, 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 God, whoa. What are you trying to tell me? I, I like how things are going now. I've got it all under control. I'm, I'm good. Now you're telling me this. And this is kind of what we, this is what Mary was doing. 
We want to, we kind of want to, we want God to work in our lives, but yet we're nervous about letting go our sense of control. This is exactly where Mary was. She had her whole life in front of her. She was going to get married. She was excited. But then this angel shows up. Here's what the angel says. Look, check this out. Verse 30. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. This is the second time the angel says, you found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And the angel goes on to say in verse 32, He will be great, and he'll be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne. I bet at this point, Mary is going, all Mary is hearing is blah, 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 because she heard, you're going to conceive and bear a son. I don't think Mary heard anything else the angel said. I'm not sure Mary could comprehend it all. And so the angel goes on to say, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. Da, 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 da. And this is how Mary responds. Verse 34, I love this. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be? Since I'm a virgin. Folks, this is, this is exactly what happens to us. This, God shows up into our lives. He wants, to, he wants to do something in you. It's exciting. But you think, oh, whoa, how will this be? God, you don't really, you obviously haven't paid much attention to my life lately. You don't know all the details. You don't know all the obstacles. Can I just, you know, kind of relate to you all the details of how this is not ever going to work with me? This is, what we, this is exactly what Mary was probably doing. And I think I've thought about this a lot of different ways. Mary's dealing with a lot of things here. Mary is, first of all, she's dealing with, okay, how am I going to tell this to Joseph? Hey, Joseph. Hey, how are you doing? Oh, I'm pregnant. It's not what you think. There was this angel that showed up. I mean, who's going to believe that story, right? Who, who's going to believe that an angel shows up and says, oh, by the way, you're pregnant. You know, how's that work? And, and then nobody's going to believe this. And I think she's got to be thinking about, how am I even going to tell my community? Before too long, this, this belly of mine is going to get bigger and bigger because of what happens with pregnant women. And everybody's going to go, she's the girl. She's the one. That's her. Bickering and talking and gossiping about Mary. That's what's going to happen. How, how is she going to tell her mom and her dad? Well, mom and dad, there was this angel. If my kids came up to me and said, I would be going, you all have lost your mind. Right? But I mean, all these things, this is what Mary was dealing with. In Mary's culture, being pregnant before being married was a death sentence. Think about what Mary was thinking. The angel didn't really kind of collaborate with her about all that she had to deal with and all that she had to think about. He just said, look, you're going to you know, bear a son. And you're going you're gonna to call him Jesus, and here's what's going to happen. I mean, so she's thinking, well, even if they don't kill me, how am I going to deal with all the embarrassment of this for the rest of my life? She's going to go into restaurants. She's going to go through the villages. And people go, going to say, there, there she is. That's that girl. She's the one that got pregnant before marriage. That's what's going to happen to Mary. Folks, I want you to know, teenagers, listen to me. Mary, as a teenager, was the first to suffer for Jesus. So this is what Mary did. She suffered. And then she was asking this question, how can this be? How can this be? See, I think, I think this gives us a different perspective of Christmas because I think so many times we just look at Christmas. And we go, oh, look at the cute little manger and we have our little nativity scenes on our coffee tables and they're just cute and Mary's smiling and Joseph's happy and all the shepherds are happy and there's Christmas trees and there's lights and there's candy canes and there's fairies swimming around. I mean, it's just, it's just cute and it's wonderful and it's fun. But I want you to understand that, folks, really the Christmas story is a lot more grittier than that. The Christmas story had real feelings and real lives were at stake in this story. And, she, and, and Mary's going, how can this be? How can this be? And I think for Mary, it wasn't just a negative, how can this be? 
I think probably there was some, me? How can this be for me? Really, God? Are you serious? Me? I mean, I mean, I want to tell you, as you follow God, listen, this is for everybody. As you follow the Lord, there's, there's going to be times where he brings you to a place where you are going to have to contend with God. And you're going to have to look at him and say, how can this be? In fact, I would say it this way. Are you really following God if at some point you haven't already asked, how can this be? Christians, let me just kind of challenge you this morning. When was the last time you contended with God and you said, how can this be? Not just in the negative, not just when you lose a loved one, not just when you lose your job, not just when you're bankrupt, when your marriage is failing. I mean, sure, we're going to say, God, how can this be? But I'm, I'm talking about what was the last time in following God, God brought you to a place where he's going to push you farther than you've ever been outside your comfort zone and you've contended with God and you said, how can this be? You want me to do what? I, I encourage you, I challenge you, this is what we should be doing as Christians. I think most of us as Christians, maybe what we're doing instead is we're just kind of playing it safe. And we're never risking anything for the kingdom because it's risky. It's unsafe. And when you're, un, when you're, when you're safe and when you're not taking any risk for the Lord, you're never contending with God and you're never asking the question, how Will this be? Folks, I believe, listen, listen, listen. I believe God's bringing all of us as Christians to a point. He's leading us to bow the knee and to look at him and say, how can this be? In fact, I would be worried as a Christian if you are not regularly asking God, how can this be? How am I here? How, how have you blessed me with a family? How, how have you given me this church family? God, I, you saved me from my sins. How can this be? You, you, have, you have put me here. You've blessed me. I've got, I've got a home. I've got a job. I've got a car. I've got so many. How, how, can, this, how can this possibly be? How can it I mean, as Christians, we need to be just almost every day singing, Amazing love, how can it be that you, my king, would die for me? That's what we need to be singing as Christians. How can it be? How can it be, God, that you love me so much that you sent your son Jesus to die for me? How can it be? This should be a regular occurrence. Christians, listen, when was the last time? You just kind of continued with God and stood in wonder of who he was and just said, how can this be? That, that, it, this ought to wreck us. This ought to just bring us and fill us with emotion. Where, where is that, church? Where's that emotion? Is church just, you know, become something we just kind of check off a list? Yeah, I went to church today. Yeah, big deal. Sang a song. Gave him the offering. Well, when was the last time you were filled with emotion? Folks, this should be a regular occurrence. This is what Mary teaches us in the Christmas story. How can this be? So the angel responds to Mary's question. In verse 35, I love this. And the angel answered her. By the way, when you ask the question, God answers. God answers. The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. <laughs> wow, there's a powerful thought, right? By the way, it's not about you, it's about God in you, right? This is what the angel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Let me encourage you today, Christian, by saying that when God comes upon you, he will never ask you to do something that you can do in your own power. Some of you didn't catch that. 
When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and when God calls you and he takes you to the end of yourselves, he's never going to ask you to do something that you can do in your own power. Because it's not about you. It's about God in you. He's going he's to take you to where Frodo and Sam were. And you're going to take that next step and you're going to say, this is the farthest I've ever been out of my comfort zone. And God's just going to say, look, I'm here with you. I'm, going to, I'm not ever going to leave you. I'm, going to, I'm not ever going to forsake you. I'm with you. This is, what, this is what he did for Mary. Look at what Mary's response was. I love verse 38. And Mary said, behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Here's the good news today, church. Listen. This is all that God is looking for from you. He, it's a posture. It, it, it's, it's a resolute stance that says, let it be to me according to your word. Let it be to me according to to your word. God, I don't know what this all means. This is a little strange. This is a little uncomfortable. I don't know what the next step is, but you're stirring. Let it be to me according to your word. God, I'm not sure what the next step is. I'm stepping into the unknown. I can't really conceptualize it in my mind, but may it be to me according to to your word. And maybe some of you are saying, look, God, I know you want me to take this next step. I know I'm supposed to take this next step, but I am frightened. I'm scared. What are people going to think? It's weird. It's, it's uncomfortable. But may it be to me according to your word. Mary gives us this, this pattern, this, this response that God is looking for from all of us. He, but folks, listen. Good news. He doesn't want you to have to figure it all out. You don't have to have it all figured out. He just wants a willing heart. You don't have to have all the answers. He just needs you to say, let it be to me according to your word. This is what God is looking for. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to be willing. This is it. Why? Why? I mean, why? Why this response? Why let it be to me according to your word? Why this response? Well, it's because every act of obedience on our part is a step toward complete surrender. Every act of obedience on our part, every time we say, let it be to me according to your word, every time we say that, it's a step toward complete surrender. So folks, listen. Take a step. What's your step this morning? For some of you in this room, listen to me. For some of you in this room, that step needs to be, you need to be saved. You need to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. You've never made that decision. You've never taken that step because you're afraid, you're frightened. You want to be in control. You need to take that next step of salvation. For some of you, listen, for some of you, you need to follow the Lord and believers' baptism. How could you, how could you possibly say, yes, I'm a Christian, I want to follow the Lord, but you're not obedient to his word. Some of you are afraid, you're frightened, you're scared, you're, you're intimidated, worried about what other people are going to think. It's, a, it's the next step to, to, to share your faith with the world, to follow the command of scriptures to be baptized. Some of you, your next step needs to be that you need to join this church, you need to be a part of this body of believers. You need to be able to show up and just say, look, I'm all in. You can count on me. I'm here. I'll be able to serve. I'll be able to teach. I'll be able to go. I'll be able to be on mission. Some of you just need to do that. For some of you, you know what this looks like for some of you? For some of you, this is a step of leadership. Into leadership. For some of you, you need to step up into leadership in this church. A servanthood. Maybe you need to teach something. Lead something. Some of you, you ready for this? Some of you need to move. Some of you need to quit your job. Some of you need to move to another state, another country, and follow what God is stirring in your heart. Let me tell you something. We'll celebrate that with you. What's your next 
Stand. Listen, listen to me, church. Listen to me carefully. We are never going to go anywhere unless we get here. As individuals and as a church, we need to come to an end of ourselves. We need to come to a point where we just kind of let go and let God take over. Folks, we've got, there's, there's so much kingdom work to be done. There are lost people that need Jesus. There are children and teens that need to be discipled, cared for, and reached out to. There's the poor and needy in our community that we need to reach out to and touch. What is your next step? And folks, when you, when you come to an end of yourself, when you take that next step, listen to me, this is what happens. This is what you'll learn. You'll learn it's not about you. It's about God working in you. This is what God wants to show us in the Christmas story. Be it unto me according to your word. Now, here's what's interesting. I'll, I'll tie the knot. When Mary said that, when Mary looked at that angel and said, be it unto me according to your word, she was laying the groundwork for what Jesus was going to do with her son. 33 years later when Jesus was kneeling in the garden he was praying until his sweat became his drops of blood and just like Mary said be it unto me according to your word Jesus kind of echoed that thought and said nevertheless not my will That's walking with the Lord. That's the good news. Is that every good gift, think about it, this is a Christmas thing. Every gift you're going to receive this Christmas comes out of somebody else's surrender. Every good gift, including your salvation, comes from the other side of somebody else's surrender. And if, friends, listen, if an eternal God has bowed his knee for you, eternal God has sent his son Jesus to become flesh and dwell on this earth in humanity and die a death for you. Are, you. are you willing to trust him? Are you, are you willing to take that next step? I look across the room and I know there are many here that need to take that. Some of you know exactly what that next step is. You've known it for a long time. You just haven't had the courage to take that step. And I encourage you to learn from the Christmas story this morning. To kind of have a heart of Mary. And even though you may be asking, how can this be? May I pray that your posture, your resolute spirit will be, be it to me. thank you for showing us in this Christmas story, in this incredible story of Mary and all that she was dealing with, how she had a willing heart. She was willing to look at you, God, and say, be it as unto me, according to your word. God, may we as Christians in this room have that stance. I'm just going to talk to Christians just for a minute. If you're a Christian here, if you're a believer, and there's some areas of your life where you feel like God is stirring, or maybe you're just kind of clueless about what the next step in your life is, and you, you become stagnant or complacent, this altar is for you to come and just pray and say, God, be it as unto me. Maybe your prayer is, God, I'm not sure I know what the next step is, but I'm, I'm willing to trust you. I'm willing to take that step into the unknown. And even though I'm screaming in my heart, how can this be? 
Not ultimately, my posture, my stance is be it as unto me according to your word. Maybe there's somebody here today that's lost without you. Maybe there's somebody here that needs Jesus. God, what an incredible moment this could be for them just to kind of get out of their seat, come down, talk to Pastor Marty, talk to myself. I just need to be saved. God, we would love to see life change today. God, I would love to see Christians rise up and have that resolute spirit that Mary had. I pray that God will look at Christmas from a different perspective. And God, when those times come, when you show up and stir our hearts, God, that we'll take a step forward. We'll step into the unknown. We'll trust you with everything that's in us. And we'll just celebrate your amazing love in our lives. And I pray this in your name. Amen. The church, look at me. The altar is going to be open as we sing this amazing song called Amazing Love. How can it be? Is that your prayer? Are you in wonder of what God is doing in your life? Maybe you just want to come today to the altar and just thank God and say, God, I don't know how I've gotten here. But thank you for my family. Thank you for my church. Thank you for my salvation.